Okay, here's another aspect to the battle for integration that might shed light on today, but the perspective is going to be in eternity. Um, you have to add up facts to discern what eternity is like. And it ends up being, in all events, something of a speculative exercise because although there are many facts about eternity told to us, you have to turn over those facts again and again and again and again and again. And that's the objective. That's, you know, people say, well, why isn't God more clear? Because he doesn't want to overburden you with the answer. With God, and that's this, this whole point about battle for integration, with God it's about the process. It really is. And he's basically telling you that's the answer by not giving you the answer. I mean, it's a universal complaint that all believers have. Some will admit it and some won't. When you go to read the Bible, it's complicated. First of all, you really miss at least 50% of the meaning if you're not reading it in the original. Okay, but in order to read it in the original, that takes time. You know, it, you're learning languages that are dead. The Hebrew that is spoken in Israel today has a lot of superficial similarity to Hebrew in the Bible, but there's a lot of differences, so many that really the Jews themselves have trouble reading the original Hebrew text. They really do. Um, and the same thing can be said for the Greek. Greek today is n almost nothing like Greek of the Bible. In fact, when I am reading in the Greek of the Bible and I shift over to the modern Greek text, it's, it's almost impossible for me to read the modern Greek text. I mean, I, it's like I have to look up every other word, practically. Well, not that many, but a lot. Okay? So you're learning a dead language, and not just one, but there's certain passages like in Daniel that are in Aramaic. Some of them are actually in Chaldean, which is related to Aramaic, but not the same. Um, and some of the passages are a Hebrew that is so old, like in Job, that people aren't really sure what the words mean. Okay, there are a lot of words that are, and then even when they are sure, there is what's called a semantic range in a word, and you don't know which of the many meanings in the range apply. Okay? And then on top of that, you know, you've got a lot of writing, and we don't have a whole lot of writing at that same time in Hebrew outside of the Bible. Even though the Bible is supposed to be interpreted on its own terms, what makes the Greek a whole lot easier to understand is that we have a lot of extra biblical Greek text. So it's really easy to know that the Greek in the Old Testament was written centuries before the Greek of the New Testament. At least two, three centuries. Okay? It's, it's you know, the King James only is trying to say that it was written by Origen, which was 200 AD. There's no way that's possible. No way at all. Because we have a lot of extra biblical writing from 200 AD. And it's nothing like the writing in the, old, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is translated by Jews. It, the syntax is different. The way prepositions are used is different. The way case endings is used are different. I mean, it's just... It's like when you read the King James Bible versus modern English, it's hard to read the King James. It really is. Well, it's a whole lot harder to read you know, the di the differences are even much greater between the Greek of the Old Testament and, and Greek of the 200s A.D. I have a lot of trouble reading the Greek of the 200s A.D. I don't have a lot of trouble reading the Greek of the Old Testament. There's a lot of difference between the Greek of the Old Testament and the Greek of the first century in the New Testament. That we know is first century. So, 
how are you, you know, Mr. Dumb Bunny Believer, going to understand all that? It's a struggle. And it's a process. And you're never done. Ever. You will never be able to say, I know the Bible. As a, you know, an affirmative, complete statement. Your knowledge of the Bible is always relative to what you used to know, what you will know, what somebody else knows. Like, I know the Bible better than pretty much everybody, it, definitely in my, where I live. So, that's the next point. Even when you know it, that's all you do is know it. Okay? And you might know it better than somebody else, but that's knowledge is it integrated into your life so that the flow of what you know informs all of your actions and is constantly online the answer is no it's not so yeah knowing is a hurdle it's a lifelong hurdle you're never going to know it well enough so then God's objective is not to make you stop sinning. God's objective is not to make you even know the Bible. Because if it was his objective, then he would have just binged it into your head. Now notice I said God's objective. I didn't say that God doesn't want it. It's not his objective. It's a means to an objective. And therefore, as a means, it's something that keeps on happening. See, like, if you want to go to the store, going to the store is your objective. At the store, to get there. But the means by which you get there could be on foot, or could be by a car, or maybe an airplane, or a goat. Well, if it's a really big goat. Horse. You see, there are many different means by which you can get to the objective. The Bible is a means, not an objective. So what is the objective? Intimacy with God. Okay, but He's God. How are you ever in your lifetime going to be able to say that you're intimate with Him? And the answer is you can't. And here's the kicker. In eternity... The answer is the same. That's the point. In eternity, the answer is the same. You will every day, ideally, know God better. You will ideally, every day, know Bible better. And being as you're going to be light years, more skilled, more able, more everything good... then better is really a lot better. Even the lowest of us compared to now. But he's infinite. So you'll never be able to say, I know it all. And of course you'll never be able to say, I'm totally intimate with God. And you'll never be able to say that I'm totally grown up now. They're all processes that infinitely go on. Now, in a way, that's a really great answer because it means that you will constantly, you've always got something in front that's going to constantly improve and constantly get better. So the future in the eternal state will always be tomorrow is better. And it will always be better. That's the first thing. But at the same time, you've got to realize then that the objective of God is this bettering process that keeps on getting better each day. So then it's no compromise to Him that that process starts now. See, we're hampered by our smallness. We're hampered by sin. That's Romans 3.23. 
all men have sinned. That's the first problem. And the second problem is, and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. To come short means that you aim at something and you don't finish it. You don't get there. But you're aiming. You're short of it. You're short of the goal. Well, that's perpetual. That's a hard thing for, I don't know, alpha person like me to accept. I want to get to a goal. I'm not really concerned about the means. I want to get there, and I want to get there yesterday. God's the opposite of that. Now, I get I don't know if, I guess you could call Satan an alpha, because he's really upset about it. You know, it never finishes. You never get to the goal. So you have to learn to come to love the process, which is this, this segment, you know, battle for integration. You have to come to love the battle. And, and I covered it, you know, as parts as I could understand. You know, how do you come to love the battle? Because that's really all it's ever going to be. In this increment, what I wanted to focus on, which I started to cover before, is that the battle in eternity is the king, and you have to always think of yourself as if you already were king. Just think of yourself. Put your name, you are king, and then insert your name here. So I'll use mine because I don't know yours. Uh, king Brain Out. Okay? I want to be known as Brain Out when I'm dead. Okay, I like that name. Ephesians 4.23, I really like that name. So if so, King Brainout pretend. I have to think of myself that way. I am King Brainout. I am more responsible for the good stuff and the bad stuff that happens in this world than any of the people running for presidential office. Because I have more Bible doctrine in me than them. I didn't put it there. God put it there. And you can argue all day about whether God was right or wrong to do that. He didn't do it because I'm better as a person. He did it because I asked for it. And if they ask for it, he'll do it to them. He'll do it to you if you ask for it. And if you don't ask for it, he won't. So it has nothing to do with whether you're better or worse than somebody else. It has to do with whether you wanted to get it. And you don't want to get it if you're not using 1 John 1 9. And you don't want to get it if you're not sitting under who God appointed as your right pastor teacher and it's only a male. So if you're sitting under a female pastor, you don't want to get it. And if you're not learning and living on Bible doctrine from that teacher, then you don't want to get it. So if you're under the wrong teacher, then you're saying, no, God, I don't want to grow. I don't want to get it. Then you won't. And, you know, it's not simply a black-white question like that. It's also in degrees. Are you sitting under your right teacher just sometimes? Okay? And that's always a problem. You, that, that problem never goes away. If it's only sometimes and it's not enough, then to that extent, you're not going to grow. You're saying no. God has a system. Greek word for this is chanotes, and unfortunately it's mistranslated unity in uh, Ephesians 4 5. And of course, the Catholic Church bastardized that completely. Unity means unity with God. Not unity with some institution on earth. It's a very well-defined Greek term that Plato used in the Philebus. And Paul makes a, you know, he takes advantage of all the cultural baggage of words, of, especially of Plato. Okay, for a lot of reasons. And, well, maybe not especially of Plato, but definitely of Plato. Okay, there's a culturally loaded term, chanotes. It means a system of harmony with the gods. In this case, the real God, not the gods that they hallucinated. How do you be in a system of harmony with the God? Well, you have to believe Jesus Christ paid for your sins. That saves you. Okay, that puts you positionally, juridically in heaven. You're a citizen of heaven. Blah, 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 blah. The Holy Spirit takes up residence with you. There's a part of what Paul will later call your polytuma privileges, which is in, uh, what was it, I want to say Philippians 3.20. Okay, you're a citizen of heaven now. 
you're saved, you can't go to hell, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but all those assets and privileges you might leave unused. 1 John 1 9 puts you in the spirit in terms of him filling you with his brains. That's why I call myself brain out. Ephesians 4.23 tells you that you got to have the spirit in you filling you. Okay, because he's leading up to the filling verse. Remember? Okay, in Ephesians 5, he's going on a, a, a path of, you know, steps. Okay, in Ephesians. So I got to be filled with the spirit or... You don't have any brains. Once you're a Christian, if you're not filled with the Spirit, you have no brains. So that's why I call myself brain out. So when the Spirit's brain is in you, that gets in you by you using 1 John 1 9 and being between sins. And that's second, uh, first, what was it? First John 2 2 is the reason why, because he paid for all sins. Uh, 1 John 1 9, of course, came before. And you got to name your sins because otherwise you're saying, well, I don't want to be in fellowship with you, God. So go look at, you know, 1 John, what is it? Verses 5 through 10, because that's all about fellowship. Okay, and then, what was it? Uh, Ganao. Where, where was it? First John 2 and 3 uses the term, the, the person born of the Spirit, but that's not the right translation. It should be sired by. The Holy Spirit, while you're between sins, is siring you growing you. So in order to be growing in Christ, you have to be between sins. That's the first thing. And then you're actually saying by using 1 John 1 9, you're essentially saying, okay, I don't want to be out of fellowship with you. I want to be in fellowship with you. Here's my sin. Christ paid for it. 1 John 1 7. So I'm back in fellowship again because I admitted I sinned. So you got to do that many times during the day. Okay, if you don't remember whether you sinned or not, just say, I must have sinned that. That puts you back in. Because God's not a bureaucrat. All right, you're admitting somehow, somewhere you sinned. And if you need to remember what it is, he'll cause you to remember. Ask him to cause you to remember if you want. It really is helpful sometimes. I should ask him that more often myself. Okay, but that's only part of the battle. If you have doctrine in you, then of course you're sinning. So you better ask God, who's my right teacher? And get under that teacher. And only one. One male teacher. Not a cafeteria approach. And if you're not under the one male teacher he wants, then you're telling him that you could care less about growing in Christ. And you're essentially sinning because he assigned only one teacher for one congregation, Ephesians 4.16. It's not multiple teachers, it's one. Pastor and sheep. The sheep is plural, the pastor singular. Chafe is the word that's used in Ephesians 4.16 for pastor. Male only. So if you're rejecting the that then you're under divine discipline like you can't believe. I've, I've seen people, how do you want to call it? I've seen people go crazy. Mentally ill. Because they refused the teacher. Okay? Um, so that is the second part. The third part is you got to, like, if you're under the teacher, you listen, you learn, and live on what the teacher says. And, yeah, is the teacher going to get it wrong sometimes? Of course. But whether he gets it wrong or not, what are you supposed to do? You listen and learn, you learn and listen to what he says. You go to God about it, whether you have trouble with it or not, and practice with God. Hi, Dad. I learned this. What do you think? Am I understanding it right? It doesn't sound... I don't get this. Blah, blah, blah. Talk to God all the time. God knows there's enough free time during the day when you're standing in line, when you're waiting at the bus, when you're taking a shower, when you're eating your breakfast. Talk to God. If you're not doing that, then you don't want fellowship with God. That's tantamount to sinning. So you won't grow. Now, that all matters because, as you can just guess now, 
that's a battle all of its own. It's a battle for integration just to remember to learn and live on Bible, let alone in the original languages with your dad and all the time that that's going to take, all the battling there. And it's battle, 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 battle. The rest of the world is not doing that. And so they're not growing. I mean, they're growing, but not in God. They're growing in their works. They're growing in human approbation. They're growing in legalism. They're growing in religiosity. They're growing in stupidity. They're growing in falsehood. They're growing in false doctrine. They're growing in the ways of this world. So they are growing. But when they're dead, all that growth becomes a sort of mind process that they're stuck with. It's all horizontal. Not necessarily sin, but it's all horizontal. They don't have the vertical highway that can only be developed through the spiritual life. And without that vertical highway, you can't be king. You, you, can, you can't even be the dog catcher. Not in heaven. So the first time they're going to start to have any vertical shoots, any vertical roots, any vertical seeds, is when they're dead. And guess who gets to provide that for them? Their king. Not. God uses the king, as it were, as a sort of teacher. God uses the king as the pastor. I'm sure that there are going to be sub-teachers underneath, but the king is like the embodiment of Christ. He's the closest representation of Christ that they're going to see. I mean, Christ comes on a circuit throughout the universe, but who knows, it might be a thousand years since you last saw him. And when you saw him, you saw him for two seconds and you saw the tips of his fingers waving. Because you were, you know, 16,000 people back. Rank has its privileges, and the privilege is to be close to him. So you can see him more often. And the other privileges, and this is, it, it's something that has to grow as a habitual thought pattern. The other, path, the other, you know, privileges that you get to actually communicate him to your kingdom. You're going to be given them as assets. You're going to own the people, own them. That's what, uh, uh, what was it? Isaiah 53, 12 says. It's not the only verse. What's the other ones? Okay, it's the lead verse. Anyway, the point is that, you know, you're going to own them. They're going to be your property. You don't knife your couch. You take care of your property. They're going to be your slaves. And you are chief slave to him. And as chief slave who owns them and owns, you know, billions and billions and billions of dollars on their behalf. Because all the assets that should have gone to them, each one of them who were supposed to be kings, they essentially forfeited. So all that money goes to you. Because they are owned by you. So everything they were supposed to get, you get. That's the way I'm interpreting Isaiah 53.12. Now, that's a pretty likely interpretation, given that we are supposed to have everything he has. We all share everything in Christ. Well, if we share everything in Christ, and he's a ruler, but you don't get to the place where you get crowned at the end, then all the assets that should have gone to you as a ruler are going to have to go to the ruler who's ruling over you. That's where I'm getting the interpretation from, that kind of logic. All right, so now you own them, and you own everything they were supposed to get. And so you have all those assets of all those people in your kingdom, which you're supposed to get in order to rule on their behalf. And, of course, that's what you live for. It's not that money and property and all that stuff isn't nice, but it has a limit. The enjoyability of it is very limited. The real enjoyment of life comes from seeing the happiness of your people. 
that's where it is for God by his own design and choice he didn't have to create everything this way he could have created it some other way but he obviously chooses happiness for himself to be making us happy there's no other way that you can logically interpret why we exist if he doesn't love us, then what are we here for? Because we're a pain in the neck. Well, he, he's the ultimate parent. That's why he calls himself father. And son is doing it for father. And spirit is playing mom and, and you know, doing it in us for dad and for our husband who is the son. That's the family analogy. They call themselves by family names. That tells you everything about their personality. Okay, so what do you think yours is going to be as king? So the love of the battle is that you get to be, if you, you have to battle yourself every day because you're the microcosm of the kingdom. All of your problems you're going to have that you have right now in your life is going to be, as it were, paradigmal of the problems of your kingdom. And that's the lesson he's teaching me every day now. Every time something goes wrong, and I'm having a lot of problems right now. It's like, at first, my first thought is, well, where am I screwing up, Dad? What am I doing wrong? Because I'm always doing something wrong. But that's not the primary reason for my problems. The primary reason is, hi, the people who are going to be in your kingdom, this is how difficult it's going to be for them to process. So I got problems in my life that are like instructive of the structure of the problems that people in that eternal future are going to have. Which is a very interesting statement because that means the problems exist in eternity. See, we think of perfection as meaning no problems. That's not God's definition. God's definition is, as it were, the successful processing of problems. And when you stop to think about it, that's really the only valid definition of perfection. I mean, think about what, you you got to have some hobby that you really like. You know, think about your favorite hobby. Do you like fixing Harley Davidson's? Do you like playing with uh, piano? Do you like ballet? Do you like classical music? Do you like going to NASCAR races? Whatever it is that you like as a hobby or to do in your free time, if you think about it real closely, you'll realize that there are a lot of problems in pursuing your interest. But you don't think of them as problems. You think of them as part of you doing the thing you love. That doesn't mean you're always pleased with it. That doesn't mean it always feels good. But you want to do it. That's the way it is in the eternal state. This, this is my biggest hurdle to spiritual growth for me. I don't like this being true. And God is, you know, busy explaining. It's true because everybody's going to be different from each other. And 99.9% .9 of us are, will have rejected the spiritual life. So the first time we're actually going to have a usable spiritual life is when we're dead. See, you're saved and you have a spiritual nature the first nanosecond you're saved. But it turns off the second you sin. So you need one job online to turn it on. And it turns off if you're not under your right teacher because that's, that's an immediate sin. So even if you use one job online, you're not under your right teacher, so you're right back in carnality again. Two seconds after you have just first admitted you sinned. So then you're perpetually carnal. So then you're learning nothing. 
And if you're under your right teacher, but of course you're not learning and living on what he says, that's tantamount to rejecting the teacher. So you're not growing. You're carnal. So that's where most people are. If that's where most people are, then the first time their spiritual life is going to turn on. It just sleeps the whole time you're down here until you're dead. And eventually God will kill you due to you not using one child one night. Happened to one of my own parents. I had to tell her that that was why it was happening. She's the one who taught me the verse. It's really embarrassing. I didn't know that until seven years before she died. It's that important. Using 1 John 1 9. But if you're not doing the other steps, then you are tantamount to being back in a state of sin. Even if you use 1 John 1 9, it only lasts for like a few seconds and then you're back in sin again. Because you're not, you're either rejecting the teacher, you're rejecting what the teacher taught, or you're not talking to God about it, so you're not using what the teacher taught. So you can see how easy it is to understand. Well, see, that means pretty much everybody in Christianity is carnal. So whatever it is they're learning, it's not God. Might have a semblance, you know. So what was that? Second Timothy two twenty six through three seven. He wants you to read the whole context. Three seven is you know always learning but never coming to an epinosis knowledge of the truth. Epinosis means buildable knowledge, buildable in the spirit. Otherwise, it's just hot air. Okay, so as a believer. Your battle down here, mostly with yourself. To get in that system, to get into that chenotes, and to stay in it. Because you'll fall out all the time. I'm falling out all the time. You just, I, Dad, I screwed it up again. Get back in. And you'll fall down five minutes later or whatever. Dad, I screwed up. Get back in. Just keep getting back on the horse. Poco a poco se va lejos. Okay, little by little you go far. So you do that, you become king, and then what you went through down here in your body, this is the point of the audio, what you go down here, go through down here in your body is paradigmal and will set the structure for how you help others in the eternal state grow. And then you'll love the fact that you had the troubles you did down here. And then you'll love your job. Because you'll have total empathy for them. You will know on the inside what it's like for them to live. Because you're their God. Christ is not kidding when he said, Ye are gods, in John 10.34. And I did the Ye are gods videos. I put them in the uh, ddna.htm webpage. It's a real easy way to look at them. Because both of them are side by side. That's why he did that. It's an update on Psalm 82. And I did the Psalm 82 playlist in Vimeo. Psalm 82 channel. So that you can see that the Psalm 82 verse 1 is mistranslated. But Christ in John 10.34 is quoting... Psalm 82, 6. But you have to read it from verse 1 to understand the joke that he's making out of it. Christ is God-man. We're to be cloned from him. So what does that make us? Gods. And in the immediate context of Psalm 82, it was the rulers. The rulers. I have said you are gods as rulers because it's a sort of analogous role. Okay, but it's much closer to really being him in the eternal state compared to what we are now. We will be gods because that God does not have to put up with lesser than. This is something that 
you know, average Christianity just doesn't get. They think it's arrogant to say, ye are gods, is literal. Of course, the Mormons just completely misunderstand the point. God should not have to put up with lesser than. Do you want your children to stay children their whole lives just so you can say you're better than them? Well, God doesn't think like that. Don't you get tired of being around your kids? Don't you wish that you and the spouse could go off to Mexico or Acapulco or, you know, Tahiti for just a week so you could just be around another adult and just be together? Instead of being around, Mommy, Daddy, Mommy, Daddy. Of course you do. So what? We, we should expect God should want us to be lower than Him forever? If He's omnipotent, and He is, then He can do something to stop us from being so low. In fact, that's Satan's big complaint. Satan knows that very well. I, Satan's a lot higher than us. And he's, he's basically accusing God of making us too low. That was his argument, you know, sort of voce in Job 1 and 2. Okay, you're basically, oh, see, you're bribing Job. You're making Job's life better, so of course he'll praise you. And underneath that is like, you can make Job be better than human. Look at me. Christ is God, man. We're designed to be in total union with him. So what do you think that has to mean? Ye are gods. Well, then God isn't talking to somebody who's lesser than. Christ is God and man. So what do you think's going to happen to us? Christ said, ye are gods. Gen 10.34 so yeah, you got, as it were, two natures. One is functional, and the other is, I don't know what you want to call it, static. You're human. But you got the thought of God flowing through you. That's the functional deity. The function of deity in the static of humanity. Christ was both the f function and the static of deity. And the static of humanity. In one person. Run by the Holy Spirit in his humanity. Because that would mean that he's not using his own deity. So he's not cheating. And if he had ever sinned, then he'd lose the power of the Spirit. And I, I hate to even think what that would do to the union of his deity and his humanity. Should have torn him apart. So how hard was it to not sin? I can't even imagine. It must have been beyond any temptation I can even possibly list, let alone know. Okay, so how much bigger are you and I going to be in the eternal state? Therefore, we need the bigger structure of the Bible in our head, the way it was in his head, to be able to tolerate that kind of intensity. And that's why what you live for as a king is to make your kingdom better. Make your people be closer. Because there's too much of a gap between you and them. And that's what you're going to spend your money on. The libtards ought to be really happy about this. This is the ultimate liberal design. And it's meant to be. Because Satan's utopian argument is exactly the same as the liberals. They don't realize they're getting it from Satan, but they are. His argument is, well, why don't you zap everybody and make us, you know, totally gorgeous, totally beautiful, totally with all these powers, instead of making us struggle for it? And the answer is because God's about the process, not about the status. But when you have the status, it's a much higher status than Satan wants or envisions or even understands. Union in God's soul, as it were. Union with his thinking. Satan doesn't actually want that. Satan wants to beat God. 
Satan thinks it's all about humans, well not human, but about self-status, self-worth, I'm better than so-and-so, see how good I am. To me, that's about the most boring thing you can you could ever even dream of. Do you want to stand in front of a mirror and smile at yourself and, oh, how good I am, how pretty I am, how smart I am? How long before that becomes totally boring? Two and a half nanoseconds. To me, that's, that's hellish condemnation, to have to stand in front of a mirror. And the better you look, the worse it is. Because who are you seeing? Yourself. whoop de doo I see myself every day already. I don't want to stand in front of a mirror. Everybody else is more interesting. Can I leave now? See? But Satan is like preening all the time in front of a mirror. So he doesn't get this. He's childish. So ask King another reason to want the battle for integration. First of all, because that makes you closer to God in eternity. And you're the repository. You are the representative of Christ to them. You are their God. And the reason to be their God that you would want as the reason, totally the opposite of Satan's reason, the reason you'll want it is because you want to bring them up. You want them close, not far away. The, the idea of being better than them is, is so painful. It's painful. It's the last thing on the planet you want. You want to bring them up. You want them to have what you have. You want them to be on the same level with you. You want them to be your friends, not your subjects. You want to be their slave, not them be your slave. But that can't happen. Because they said no. They said no to his thinking down here. They determined the size of their soul. They determined that their souls will only be able to process information horizontally. So then you as king have to spend a lot on the whole and then wait for them to all process it horizontally. The same thing is true in, in, in the world's economy, by the way. It's not trickled down. It's flooded onto the people. And then they spread it amongst themselves. Your libtards never understand rules of economics. Okay. A rich person has a lot of money. And he takes his huge amount of money and he spends it all on investment, on trinkets, on booze, on whatever he spends it. And then that sits at the bottom. And then spreads around horizontally. And you have to wait for that to happen. Because people don't know what to do with it. So it's it's an immediate. If you have 20, $260 million, you're going to spend it. But you spend it in different ways. And some of that spending is we would call investment. But it really is spending because it's immediately loaned out to people who need money. And then they spend it. So it's, it's, it's you're dumping the $260 million on the populace. But once they get it, they cycle it around each other horizontally. Well, same thing is true for Bible doctrine. A pastor teaches a congregation, and he's giving all of it at once to a bunch of everybody hearing the same thing at once, but then they have to process it horizontally. And that takes time. So you have to repeat, 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 do it over, do it over, do it over, and eventually... They get familiar. And then they start vertically growing. Vertical, vertical, vertical. And they get closer and closer and closer and closer to his own understanding. So he's bringing them up. And as a king, that's your job too. 
So when you go through stuff in your life right now, the primary reason you're going through whatever's happening to you right now, are you rich, are you poor, are you sick, are you well, are you know, are you having glitches with your email, are you having something that just goes well and it's like wonderful? Whatever those experiences are, they're all down payments. Arabon. Ephesians 1.14, which is talking about the Holy Spirit, but it, it also applies here. They're all down payments on a structure and an understanding of what your kingdom is going to be like. Because they're all going to have similar issues that apply to them then in the eternal state. Because it will always be a struggle. The difference between now and then is it's a struggle everybody's going to love. Just like you love your favorite hobby or your favorite, you know, thing to do during the day. Everybody's going to love learning Bible through the King. That's, that's the number one enjoyment going on in heaven right now. That's why Peter wrote, what was that? Angels long to look. That's how it's translated in English. I don't remember the Greek. And I'm not sure where it is. First Peter, second Peter. Into which angels long to look. You have to look it up. <laughs> That was cute. Okay. You have to look it up. <laughs> Angels love looking at us right now. They're learning about God by watching us. I don't know how many angels and possibly humans do for all I know. Are watching me lay down on my back. Talking into this little recorder. And Olympus... 702 PC which is still on sale on Amazon one of the best recorders I've ever had has a little SD slot that you can put an SD card into it's got all these little bells and whistles on it how many angels are watching me do this? I don't know because they're invisible of course but whatever, however the number is at least one my guardian angel is learning probably guardian demon too is learning. They're learning about God through stupid me talking. And it's entertaining for them. I'm glad of that. And I'm doing it because I need to practice because I have to assume I'm going to make it. You have to assume you're going to make kingship. This is on-the-job training. God is treating you as if you're a king right now. The world is being blessed or cursed because you're here. So when you're screwing up, the world's being cursed. When you're using one job one nine, suddenly it turns to blessing. You're using that often. I just used it now. <laughs> okay? The world is being blessed because you're talking, or you're thinking, or you're sitting on the toilet, or whatever the hell it is you're doing. Because you're a king now, training to be one in eternity. And the world is blessed or cursed based on what you think. That nobody sees, or that maybe others see, but God sees it, so you get blessed or cursed. And unfortunately, the world around you, your block that you live on, your family, your friends, your co-workers, your region, your country, your home country, and your host country, if you're outside of your home country. And of course, you can pray too, and that will bless people. Anything you pray, you ask in his name, he'll do it. You have to believe that. Like, what was it? He just threw James at me. Let him doubt. Let him ask him without doubting. And when, I, when it says doubting, it doesn't mean, well, I'm not sure that he's going to want to do this. That's not doubting. Doubting is like, well, God isn't going to do this because I wanted it. Or God isn't going to do this because, you know, I'm not sure he, 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 he's going to listen to me. It's not like that. Maybe what you're asking, he won't want to do. 
That's up to him whether he wants to do it or not. That's not doubting. That's respect. But if you think, oh, God's not going to do that, I shouldn't ask. That's doubting. Ask him everything. You know, if he doesn't want to do it, he won't do it. But don't doubt that he can. All right, so you can pray. And you can learn and live on Bible under your right teacher using one job one night as much as possible. To that extent, you're ruling already. And that same process and that same struggle that you're going through right now, and this is bad news, is the same struggle that you're going to go through a billion years from now. The difference between now and then is you will love it a billion years from now. You will love it after you're dead. And when he he's insisting on is that you can learn to love it even before you die because Christ loved it even on the cross and that's Hebrews 12 too I don't love it yet but I believe him so I gotta go practice what I just said so you think about it talk to God about it peace out